Uh, yet, intra-regional trade accounts for less than 5% of their overall trade. And a recent World Bank study shows that if you actually looked at the economic complementarities and the geographical proximity of the South Asian countries, they should be trading three times more than uh, what is the case. Uh, and uh, South Asian countries are trading more with outside of South Asia compared to with its own neighbors. And in fact, uh, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka have 2.9 times more restrictions on trade on its South Asian partners uh, compared with the rest of the world. So these are just some of the numbers that show you that uh, even though you have a, a SAFTA, is that called? South Asia Free Trade Area, uh, where there has been a, a program of tariff reduction, uh, barriers still exist, including physical barriers of connectivity. Uh, and uh, also, uh, digital connectivity, I think, would be another uh, important area for us to look at, given the potential for digital economy uh, and how countries can, developing countries, small developing countries, isolated countries can actually leapfrog uh, if they were digitally connected. So these are some of the, of the main uh, themes that we want to address uh, in this uh, session. We have four very excellent speakers representing different parts uh, of the region as well as somebody from the private sector. Uh, the first panelist is His Excellency Abdullah Abdullah, Chief Executive of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, uh, who was also the CEO uh, in 2014 and 2018, and he has had a long career in, in government, including being the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The second panelist is His Excellency KP Sharma Oli, Prime Minister of Nepal, second term as the Prime Minister of Nepal, a position he has held since 2015, and he has had a, an instrumental role in fighting for uh, Nepal's <coughs> constitution as a democ democratic country, and I think has been very instrumental in laying out uh, the ground for the economic transformation of his country. Uh, third, third panelist is uh, Sigve Breke, uh, president and CEO of Telenor Group uh, Norway, which is a telecommunications company dealing with mobile, broadband and TV services with a strong footprint uh, everywhere in the world, I think, but also in South Asia as well as uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, finally, uh, last but not least, Professor Raghu Rajan, Catherine Dusak Miller, Distinguished Service Professor of Finance, University of Chicago Booth School of Business USA, who has had a distinguished career in academia, is an expert in the financial sector, has served in the IMF, and most recently in the Indian, Indian government as chief economic advisor, as well as the central bank governor to the Reserve Bank of India. So we have an excellent panel. Uh, of speakers, and I'm going to start by asking uh, His Excellency Abdullah Abdullah from Afghanistan, uh, if you could share with us what are the challenges of economic development uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and how you see the prospect for regional cooperation as playing a role uh, in uh, in your country's development, and what would be the challenges that you see uh, in furthering uh, economic integration in South Asia? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in spite of the security challenges that we are faced with, uh, in terms of uh, connectivity and also utilizing the potential of Afghanistan, uh, South Asia or Central Asia, Asian country, uh, some work has been done. A lot of work, I can, I can say, if we look at the uh, Afghanistan's participation in the regional organization, part of SARC, different agreements, uh, SAFTA, APTA, which is with uh, Pakistan, ECO, ECO, uh, CARIC, which is again uh, Central Asian uh, Afghanistan uh, initiative, uh, and uh, regional economic cooperation organization called RECA, uh, which, is, uh, which was an initiative by Afghanistan in the earlier days. Uh, today we have the Chabahar connectivity uh, after quite a while, but there is a slight challenge because of the uh, sanctions, but it's still, uh, still that, is, uh, uh, that is a viable project which will improve the economies of uh, uh, Afghanistan, South Asia, and Central Asia. As you yourself rightly mentioned, the least integrated region, perhaps, in the world, economically, in terms of trade, in export and import, is the South Asia, while uh, uh, arguably at one time 
it claimed like uh, 25% of uh, GDP of the world. Uh, today, uh, trade between some of the countries of the region, or if they, if they want to trade with Brazil, South American countries, or, or, or Africa, it's much easier than, uh, than doing it uh, uh, within, within themselves. You give the figures about it while the potentials are uh, uh, multiplied by many folds uh, if it is utilized. Of course, uh, the national security perceptions uh, and uh, uh, policies uh, and uh, conflict, of course, unfortunately. But this is not the only area where there has been some tensions or conflict. Uh, other countries, uh, East Asia, Pacific, oh. have seen this in the past, and they have uh, overcome it. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's the uh, picture uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, Afghanistan, through some uh, projects, regional projects, like TAPI, which is Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India, gas, uh, gas. Uh, transmission project, TAP, which is between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it's mainly electricity, Kaza 1000, which is Central Asia, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan, digital Kaza, which is mainly the digital mm. aspect of it, the fiber optic uh, connectivity. Afghanistan has a unique uh, position. Uh, at the same time, when, when it comes to our uh, direct trade with some of the countries, there are barriers, for example, Waga, which could be uh, the best uh, and shortest land connectivity for us mm. uh, between Afghanistan and India, and vice versa, uh, is uh, not being uh, utilized. Mm. Yeah? In the same way, of course, it's, uh, uh, it's like tit for tat. Uh, the access to Central Asia, to Tajikistan, we also have a position that if you, if you are not allowing us to utilize this, how can we? So the, these are the sort of things, and, and on top of that, um, uh, tariff barriers, uh, non-tariff barriers, which emerge and in, in creates uncer uncertainty, uh, and uh, uh, the list of sensitive goods, like 30% of the items which could be uh, traded between, between some of the countries of the South Asia, uh, it, it, it makes 33% of all goods, mm. yeah. not to reducing it, or uh, mm, uh, lack of resolve or determination, political will, mm. to implement the agreements which exist mm. and move forward and, uh, and take uh, further initiatives. These, these are like the overall uh, uh, implications. These have over, overall implications on our situation in, in utilizing the uh, potential of Afghanistan. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We'll come back uh, for another round of questions, but I'd look, like to now uh, come to uh, Prime Minister uh, Sharma for, and ask you the same question. How do you see the developments in Nepal? Uh, you, you're laying out some uh, structural reform program. How does that? It, how is that hap uh, developing? What are the ch main challenges? And how do you see uh, the role of regional cooperation in playing a role in the development of Nepal? Uh, and maybe you can also reflect on, you know, the, it's not just the economic issues, obviously, but it, there's also the, the security challenges uh, and the conflicts or tensions between uh, countries that are preventing uh, more progressive uh, development of uh, SARC or SAFTA. And given that uh, Nepal is the chairman of SARC uh, this year, you might want to reflect on what you, what you plan to do <laughs> ahead. Uh, Thank you, Madam Pangistu. Uh, Nepal has uh, just entered into a new phase, new stage. Uh, Nepal is developing and being changing very fastly, uh, politically and economically. It is developing its um, uh, friendly ties with its neighbors also, and the regional organizations and uh, all aspects are developing fastly and changing very fastly. Nepal promulgated a new constitution, democratic constitution, and established a federal democratic 
a Republican system. And uh, according to the Constitution, we had to make some laws, and now we uh, completed about the um, structural changes according to the Constitution to implement the Constitution accurately. And now we are focusing our entire endeavors and efforts to the economic development for good governance and economic development. Our motto is uh, prosperous Nepal, happy Nepali. And to materialize that national desire, we are concentrating ourselves. And uh, we are introducing new policies and bringing reforms in all, each and every field of economic experts as well, and social. And we are introducing uh, social justice, improving all sectors of our society, and uh, justice and equality. Uh, empowerment of women and bringing uh, the backward sections of society in the front lines. With these efforts, now we have entered into a new uh, situation where we are optimistic and we are doing our best to uh, expand our role and increase our role in the regional and international affairs also. And on the question of regional cooperation and regional development, uh, South Asia, as you mentioned, that uh, is a country of, is a, is a, uh, a region of uh, learned people with great civilization. And uh, we have genetic memories of our learned uh, ancestors. And we have very uh, excellent diversity from the top of the world, Mount Everest, to the Bay of Bengal and uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, and this diversity, uh, within this diversity we have very fertile land and young population, mm. mostly. Uh, and th that uh, demographic dividend uh, being based on these factors, we can develop. And now we have to uh, think about to develop our regional cooperation regional trade, and for that we have to uh, create such a situation where uh, equality, justice, and win-win uh, situation for all, so that uh, we can develop and no one, no nation, no people will remain back. Uh, We are trying to invite investment and uh, uh, use technology and technology transfer and use of technology and develop connectivity between the countries. As well as we are trying to develop our uh, trade and uh, relationship with other ASEAN countries also. Yeah. Like uh, we are uh, just uh, a few months before last year, we organized fourth summit of Bimstake in Kathmandu. Uh, and uh, we handed over the chairmanship of Bimstake to Sri Lanka. And uh, that it means uh, we are connected not only with SARC, but we are connected with Thailand and Myanmar like uh, countries from where we can um, connect our trade and 
other connectivities. And for this, we have opened up uh, ways and roads and uh, land links and waterways we are going to open up uh, from India uh, also. And you uh, have <laughs> Uh, resources, and uh, uh, in this way we can develop our uh, regional cooperation and trade. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, it's not just about South Asia, but also the possibility of South Asia with East Asia. That's, that's a, I think, a very good point. Uh, Sikve, I think uh, perhaps you can reflect from the private sector perspective, especially given that you are in the telecommunications area. Uh, as uh, Prime Minister already mentioned, technology is an issue. Uh, when you talk about connectivity, digital connectivity is an issue. And I think increasingly inclusiveness through technology has become a potential path for development and allowing small countries, more isolated countries, to actually leapfrog. And uh, if maybe you can reflect on your experience in South Asia, what are the challenges and opportunities? And maybe compare with Southeast Asia, because I think this is happening in Southeast Asia. Myanmar is one country which has been able to leapfrog because of digital technology. A lot of questions. <laughs> I'll try to be, be concrete. Uh, well, Telenor, in, we are operating in, in South Asia. We are in, in Pakistan. We are in, uh, in Bangladesh. Used to be in India until a year ago and had to give up there. <laughs> Uh, so we have around 110 million plus customers mm. in South Asia, uh, South Asia, and then we are also in Southeast Asia, in Myanmar, uh, uh, Thailand, and Malaysia, with another 50 million customers. So I will try to compare a little bit uh, with what I see in South Asia versus uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I think I want to summarize your question in three main points. The first one is digitalization. The second one is harmonization. And the third one is predictability. Uh, on the digitalization, um, I think that to, you shouldn't focus only on physical trade, but also digital trade. Uh, and you should f focus on how you could leapfrog uh, development with the digital tools. For example, in, in Myanmar, as you said, we entered Myanmar four years ago. There was a connectivity penetration of less than 10%. Four years after, there is Everyone that should have a mobile phone already have it. Uh, very digital savvy. They are all using internet. We have launched uh, uh, financial services, digital services. We have launched agricultural services, and used the digital platform to leapfrog development. Basically, taking services that are only for the few in the cities out to the villages through digital platforms. We do that in Pakistan as well, uh, with, uh, with uh, running a, a bank, a microfinance bank, but also payment solutions. Uh, in Bangladesh, we do medical uh, solutions, also on digital platforms, having four or five million uh, customers using um, medical insurance and paying for it, and, and also connecting them to the hospitals and to the schools. So, so if, if you get right a digital platform, uh, you can use that to, to really uh, make uh, different type of services inclusive with, with the entire population. <laughs> but also in the inter-trade, uh, inter uh, allowing um, money transfer, also remittance, mm. uh, but also taking a position in, in the digital space. To do that, uh, you also have to allow data transfer, which is a major obstacle in most of these countries. Uh, you have to be able to, to do data flows across countries. So that's the first one. The second one is harmonization. Uh, what I see in Southeast Asia is more harmonized taxation, more harmonized regulations, uh, more har harmonized uh, frameworks. Uh, and if you want to take away some of the barriers that we currently have, and if you want to welcome foreign investors like ourselves, uh, the more harmonization uh, regionally, the better. Uh, and the third one is predictability. Uh, and, and it's predictability in terms of investment frameworks, uh, foreign investment protection, allowing uh, foreign investors to have majority uh, stakes in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the growth sectors. Uh, but it's also predictability in terms of, of um, regulations and in terms of some of the macroeconomic uh, factors that you are, are dependent on. I see that less in South uh, uh, Asia than I see it in Southeast Asia. 
So I think these are some of the, the areas that, that we have seen and, and comparing this, those two regions uh, with each other. Thank you. I think those were kind of concrete suggestions for how to have more uh, integration uh, digitally uh, on harmonization and predictability. And I think your, your point, Prime Minister, about the demographic dividend, and I, I think Afghanistan also has a, I think India also, all of the South Asian countries have a, have a large demographic dividend, which mm. makes it um, very potential for the digital economy to be a potential. Uh, fine, uh, last but not least, uh, Professor Rajan, uh, maybe you can reflect on the developments in India. India is obviously uh, more developed than some of the other South Asian countries. And uh, on the security issue, obviously, uh, India and Pakistan issue has always been one of the biggest issues when we talk about uh, the potential for South Asia uh, economic integration and cooperation. I don't know whether you want to reflect on that, uh, as well as reflect on uh, where India is in its development and how does it see regional cooperation, uh, including that India is already uh, negotiating with East Asia in the RCEP negotiations. Uh, in, in the context of we are facing greater uh, uncertainty in the trading, trading environment. So it's actually the time is right now for us to cooperate more with our neighbors in the region. Right. No, uh, it's a good set of uh, questions. Uh, of course, India shares with its neighbors uh, a variety of, uh, of both uh, strengths and challenges. I think the youth of our population mm -hmm. is, uh, is certainly a potential strength. It can turn into a problem if we don't create enough jobs. And uh, like our neighbors, that's an issue we struggle with. How do we create enough jobs for all the youth that are coming into the labor force? Um, and uh, it's, you know, we've had the fortune, uh, uh, you know, a variety of, uh, you know, good moves by a variety of governments of growing at 7% for the last 25 years. Um, it pales in comparison to only China. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, a lot of people sort of don't pay attention to the fact that this is actually quite extraordinary growth or, and, and we've done well. Uh, at the same time, we need to do far more because, uh, again, the young population demands uh, performance. And uh, like uh, our neighbors, we have issues with how do we make it easier to do business. Your point about harmonization, predictability, and so on. Um, of those, I think predictability is probably uh, more easy to achieve uh, if we put our minds to it. Harmonization, uh, I think we're seeing in the European Union some of the problems with too much harmonization, a pushback against uh, uh, an argument that uh, this is um, uh, anti-democratic and, and maybe those issues would come up in, India, uh, in, in the region again. Uh, but we can do a lot better in creating a better business environment, in allowing for inter-regional production and so on. Uh, the question is, how do we start from where we are? And uh, you know, for those who give up too easily, let's re remember that Germany and France were at each other's throat every 20 years. Uh, uh, but uh, after the end of World War II, they started with very strong cooperation in steel and coal, which were the areas where they went to war. The Ruhr, the Alsace, this was where they went to war because one side had coal, the other side had steel, and combining the two in the coal and steel pact was very important in creating the trust that then led to the European common market and then the European Union. And I wonder, in this chicken egg and egg problem in the region of how do we build trust, uh, what comes first, trust or connectivity and trade, uh, my guess is in these chicken and egg problems, you've got to start somewhere. And can we start by building trust in a few areas? Mm. Uh, I think we've already heard from Mr. Abdullah uh, about uh, shared infrastructure, uh, maybe in the power sector, power being produced in one country, sold in another country. Mm -hmm. That's a way we, we, we build uh, trust. Uh, we certainly, of course, have already water, which is uh, shared between India and Pakistan. Uh, uh, but, but could we start doing more of these, uh, these things? increase dependence in small steps so that there is uh, uh, greater trust amongst the two, um, amongst the various countries. 
Um, build out infrastructure. I mean, you can't have connectivity without having infrastructure, which is far better than what we have today. So we need more roads connecting the countries, ports connecting, uh, um, bridges connecting the countries. A lot of the trade, as you noted earlier, is through ports, when in fact we have direct borders. Why can't we build uh, uh, more connectivity in railroads and, 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 and roads, and also be able to traverse each other's country, uh, to sell uh, Afghanistan selling in Bangladesh or, or Nepal using inf Indian infrastructure? Can we uh, achieve mechanisms by which containers can be taken without being opened along the way? Those are uh, important ways we can use the region. I think part of, we, we are seeing some uh, attempts at mutual help which will uh, help increase confidence. Uh, for example, um, you know, uh, when Sri Lanka got into a little bit of financial difficulty, we did a swap arrangement with Sri Lanka, uh, helping them uh, with, with swap lines. Similarly, we have swap lines with Bhutan, but whether we could have more regional uh, swap lines which allow for uh, um, at least a, a beginning in terms of financial cooperation. Uh, of course, we all have our own uh, natural calamities, earthquakes, and so on, can we develop regional response forces so that uh, uh, that could be another way of, uh, of increasing uh, mutual um, um, benefit. The longer run, of course, we want cross-border supply chains. Uh, for that, we need really low tariffs so that we can send goods back and forth across borders. Um, the issue of policy certainty also comes here. You don't want to set up a cross-border supply chain if you're not sure what policy will be tomorrow uh, in that country. So tariffs have to be low and stay low. Now, uh, I mean, all this is possible. I think we have one very big fear and two critical relationships which are central to creating more regional uh, integration. The big fear in the region is being swamped by Indian industry, Indian services, and so on. Uh, if we do reduce tariffs, if we do open borders, will India dominate? And I think increasingly as countries are developing their own industry, Pakistan, uh, Bangladeshi textiles now is, is very, very com competitive and will give India a run for its money. So my sense is as, as countries develop a little more, some of these fears will get assuaged. But we need to, we need to work on this and, and make sure it is a process by which both countries benefit. And, and, and there are ways we can enhance economic activity across. For example, more tourism in Nepal from, from India would uh, easing that process, and, and vice versa, tourists from uh, Nepal coming into India. Ways of escalating the relationship without, without the fears of, uh, of, uh, of trade swamping. And then the two relationships that we need to work on, we've already sort of talked about the missing uh, country in this room, which is Pakistan, that we do need to develop uh, a better understanding between, uh, uh, certainly between India and Pakistan, but also uh, within the region, and embrace them more economically. Mm -hmm. uh, and outside the region, I think the biggest relationship is China. Uh, the China-India relationship, as well as the relationship between the various regional partners in China. How does that play out, and how, how much does this become hostage to the China-India rivalry? Mm -hmm. That's the other issue that needs to be discussed. It is possible to have win-win, but it does need a lot of diplomatic, careful attention. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, very useful comments. Uh, that, you know, little steps, sub-regionals, uh, sectoral, uh, building trust. I think I'm, I'm afraid I've run out of time for you to have a second round, but I think I'll, I'll open up to the audience for questions, uh, and then we can also have another round uh, of questions. So may I now open the floor to the audience who would like to pose any questions to any of our panelists? Here from there. Okay. Is there a mic? Is there a mic? Perhaps the room is small enough. Okay, so uh, <laughs> see, a lot of what is talked about just now by the panel, it's all very important, but it's all about what the government needs to do or government can do. What about business? What role business has to play? Do businesses treat each other, the other country, as strategic markets or tactical markets? Do we need to develop a brand in these markets to create a put? 
So I feel that business also has a very important role to play to increase trade between, uh, between these countries. Absolutely. Any That's a very good question. Uh, I, I'll like, if there are other questions, I'd like to take two or three questions before we ask the panelists to answer. Anybody else would like to ask uh, over here? Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. My question goes to the Rajan, uh, Professor Rajan. In regards to India's uh, policy uh, towards its uh, neighboring country, particularly when harmonizing the policies uh, in terms of uh, FTA, you have FTA with Sri Lanka, but the rest of the countries have not been able to sign on it. And how about this SAFTA, you know, the provisions, uh, how India responds towards it? One question. The second question in regards to you, during your presentation, you mentioned about China's role, how China and India go, uh, that will have a, a tremendous impact on the region. And in your uh, point of view, because you recent past, you are also in the RBI and governments, how you see this, uh, the China-India policy when it comes to trade? Thank you very much. Anybody else from, I can't see behind me, so no there's anybody from? No. Oh, okay. One more over there. How do you think, how do you think the concept of uh, the competitive ad advantage of South Asia when it comes to low-cost labor mm -hmm. will stand in the fourth industrial revolution, especially given jobs being replaced by machines, etc.? Okay, let me uh, allow each one of you to answer. You can answer all three or... Uh, or you can probably answer the business question, uh, but I think the two other, one question was particularly to uh, Raghu, but the other, the, the last question was obviously to all of you. Uh, and also the business question you can also address. So maybe I'll, re maybe I'll start with Sigva. Sure, no, business has definitely a role to play. Uh, and um, um, that's why it's important for us to, to be looked upon uh, in, um, public-private partnership. Every country in South Asia, or also in Southeast Asia, have a digital agenda, for example. They see that digitalization uh, is a driver for economic growth. Uh, and, and I would like then the government to, to invite businesses to see how can we find solutions together. Uh, and invite the businesses that are long-term, uh, and, and along that also uh, come with regulations which are predictable, which are uh, uh, also giving uh, something back to the government. For example, rather than have maximizing upfront payments every time uh, you, you, uh, you need some, some new licenses or also spectrum, put some obligations on the business. Put rollout obligations, for example, for companies like ourselves <coughs> to cover the entire population. Put service obligations, such that not only connectivity is being developed, but also services like, uh, as I mentioned, financial services, financial inclusion, medical inclusion, agricultural inclusion, and so on and so forth. Th that is the way where government and businesses can develop things together. But to do that, you need predictability, you need um, uh, also harmony, uh, you need um, regulations and, and business friendly uh, uh, protection. Then I also want to uh, comment on the last question, sure. uh, the, uh, the competitive advantages. I think you have at least two very, very uh, good competitive advantages. One is the young population. It's the young population which are going to be leapfrogging the digital uh, steps. They are going to move into as advanced digital services as they do in, in my country, Norway, or in other, other countries. And that's a big opportunity uh, for you. And, and with that comes also innovation. And what I see in countries like Pakistan and, and Bangladesh, where we operate, there's a lot of innovation now coming. New startups are being established. People coming back from the US or from Europe because they see uh, the, the, the opportunities actually for developing of new services on digital platforms. That, is, uh, that, that uh, inno uh, innovation drive that you have, uh, I think you should utilize uh, among, uh, um, along then with uh, the young population that you have. And if you do this right, you can leapfrog many other countries which are more established. Okay. Uh, uh, Excellency Abdullah, maybe you can also reflect on what was just mentioned, that you have, we have a young population, yeah. and, and also Nepal. <coughs> 
Uh, but education may be a big, Absolutely. big challenge. Yeah. Um, we are talking about uh, a region where 33% uh, of poor people yeah. live here. In, yeah, in South Asia. Uh, yeah. In South Asia. And then we have a young generation, young population demographically, uh, which uh, is an advantage and also as the uh, the question earlier with the advancement in the in technology, mm -hmm. uh, it could turn easily, it could turn into a challenge. Yeah. Oh, we are living in a co completely different world today. It's not like uh, industrial revolution or uh, medieval eras where the changes will be, the pace of changes will be slow, <laughs> predictable, where to focus, where to not. Certain countries have their own advantages and then we are in this, uh, with the speed that technology is, uh, uh, is moving forward. Uh, one is to focus on the daily issues which were part of it were mentioned here. Obstacles, barriers, tariff, non-tariff barriers, sensitive goods and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, a more uh, leveled uh, playing field for the businesses. Uh, and, uh, but does any government uh, has come, come up with a policy where to focus on education. It's extremely unpredictable and uncertain. Where to focus today? Is it only uh, mathematics and alphabet and partly technology and so on and so forth? In 10 years' time, where we will be with the technology? So apart from focusing on the uh, immediate uh, challenges, which comes the role of the uh, private sector in the research and development, as well as uh, otherwise, looking, looking ahead towards the future. Uh, we need to uh, deal with it with the, with the foresight. This is not uh, only related to, to the South Asia. Uh, this is a, a global phenomenon. Uh, but uh, the, the teachers which are teaching today, uh, in 10 years' time, uh, they will be lagging behind many leaps uh, so where is the future of education, uh, information, uh, technology, and all together? These are the questions that the statesmen as well as business leaders need to focus. This is the issue. Thank you. Yes, uh, My country, Nepal, right now, or until now, is uh, uh, in a weaker position. In a, um, in economic uh, terms. But because of the political uh, system and instability, uh, Nepal was left behind. But now there is political stability. And uh, policy also, uh, in each and every field policies are stable. So stable policies, clear policies, clear vision, and a stable government we have. And uh, we, are giving importance to not only the public sector, but also the private sector and equally uh, the uh, 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 cooperative sector uh, to create job opportunities for the young people and formal education to the children and vocational and skill training to the youths and other people. Because working population is more than 60% in our country. So uh, it's very important to create new jobs. And uh, a huge number of our young population is outside uh, in search of uh, jobs, et cetera. We want to bring them back. And with uh, skills, what they learn, we have uh, given incentives to them. And uh, in this way, we are trying to invest uh, and attract and invite the investment from outside also in the sectors, uh, uh, productive sector and the sectors which create uh, productivity and, uh, and create job opportunities. And uh, in this way, uh, we are increasing our growth rate and uh, right now, I don't want to forecast that uh, uh, we'll be the uh, fastest growing country within a few years. 
but uh, that will happen perhaps because we have possibilities. We have young population, we have resources, and we have developed connectivity um, with China also. Now we have uh, um, agreements and uh, uh, now those agreements are also in practice. So through the China, Chinese uh, territory also we can, and from uh, through India also. And waterways also we are opening in the near future. And railway connections we are um, uh, bringing from uh, Kathmandu to India, Kathmandu to uh, China, uh, and other connectivities also, and in the IT sectors also. And in each and every field, we are trying to create job opportunities for the youths and provide trainings for them. And when we we are not only giving a, a, um, attention and a stress to the development process, but when we are talking about development, or we are doing our uh, endeavors, our cons we are concentrating in uh, economic development, then we are equally aware with the environmental questions also. Uh, we are contributing a lot on the question of environment because we have mountains. And 45% forest we have. And 15% of land is covered with snow. And those snows, those eyes, those mountains have very significant meaning in the climate change, question of climate change and uh, everything. Because uh, the air which comes, if from Rajasthan, hot air comes, then near, when it comes to near of our mountains, it goes to cold because uh, mountains are always minus uh, 50 degrees Celsius or like this. And the mountains shoulder a lot, meters and meters thick ice, and recharge gradually to the rocks and the streams, the rivers. <laughs> and the famous Ganga River, its entire water, uh, 40% in the rainy season and 72% of the dry season is our contribution. Nepal is contributing on that. Our reverse contribution is there. So we are contributing and we are conscious about 60%, you can understand, 60% of our land, 45% for forest and 15% for ice. 60% of our land is contributing for the climate change uh, and to maintain the climate, uh, protecting from warming, recharging from uh, and protecting uh, from being uh, def uh, desertification. Uh, in this way, we are aware of the development efforts. Uh, development issues, trade issues, and other issues comprehensively. And uh, uh, we are uh, concentrating all our efforts which, uh, with uh, concentration on the interest of the people, improvement of the lives of the people. So people concentrated for the earth and for the people. So our development is balanced, conscious, responsible towards the earth, towards the people, and for the future generation as well. Thank you, Prime Minister. I think the emphasis on sustainable development should never be forgotten. Uh, Professor Rajan, there was a question specifically to you, and if yeah. you want to uh, comment on the fourth industry. A couple of uh, other question. issues on, on, on business itself. I mean, apart from business, uh, the social sector could be another way, uh, non-government way. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there are excellent technological institutions around the region, and could we have more sharing of students across borders? Mm -hmm. uh, the IITs, for example, are a first-rate set of institutions. We already take a number of people from different countries, and could there be more uh, uh, sort of opening? Um, so people movement. People, people movement, understanding also. also. The youth going into a different country 
at an early age they see what it's like and and there's more of an understanding that is that is built up um on the china india issue uh i i think the reality is that um I, I'm, I'll wear my academic hat, not wear my Indian hat, that, that historically India has seen the region as part of its bailiwick. Mm. And of course, China has grown uh, today much bigger than India and is posing an alternative to India. And that, of course, uh, certainly creates tensions in some quarters in India. But also in those countries, they're saying, why not? We have a big uh, alternative to India which is willing to put money, which is willing to invest in infrastructure, why not take advantage of that? Mm. Uh, my sense is th uh, uh, it does raise some issues which have to be managed over time. I think it's good to have competition in general. Uh, and But I think in the longer run, two <laughs> things will happen. First, India will become relatively bigger than it is now relative to China. China will slow, India will grow. And the competition between the two four countries in the region will become more even. India will be more capable of putting resources to work, including infrastructure, which China now promises. Second, I think China itself will have to figure out its relationship with countries and how to make sure that doesn't end in some kind of a client uh, relationship as opposed to a relationship of equals. We've already seen some pushback in certain elements of Pakistan against what is happening in, uh, uh, in the Pakistan-China relationship, similarly in Sri Lanka. But I think China is also learning in this process how to manage the relationships with countries so that uh, those countries don't become a dependency. They, they actually uh, are equal. I think all this is, over time, will uh, be good for the region. There will be much stronger uh, um, sort of uh, relationships both with India and China, but the region itself will benefit and we should, we should emphasize that. Lastly, fourth industrial revolution. I mean, it's very easy to imagine artificial intelligence all over the place, none of us have jobs and so on. I think it'll take time. And in that time, we have time to respond. Uh, my sense is, you know, we're still not doing enough on manufacturing within our countries and in regional uh, manufacturing. I mean, heavy stuff, it's hard to trade long distances. So there's a lot of scope for trading commodities, for trading steel, uh, copper within the region. And so we can go a long way. I think there's an opportunity of trading services within, creating sort of regional companies even, uh, which understand the pattern, for example, of, of local borrowing. How do people in South Asia borrow? And using that kind of information, do a better job than the existing banks. Mm. Uh, for that, we have to allow people to realize the economies of scale within the region. And that means focusing on giving the ability for cross-border FDI and so on. Mm. There is a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of opportunity still. Thank you. Optimistic note. Uh, in the last seven minutes left, uh, I'm just going to pose uh, one question and uh, for all of you. Uh, you know, whenever we talk about South Asia uh, cooperation, we tend to get uh, pessimistic because it's just too challenging. But I think uh, Professor Rajan actually provided a, a way forward that let's take small steps, whether it's sub-regional cooperation between borders for infrastructure or the liberalization of air services between India and Afghanistan, India yeah. and Sri Lanka. These are small steps, but have had a huge impact. If each one of you can think of a quick win that's practical, that's doable, that will have an impact what would it be? Uh, it just uh, uh, thinking uh, what would uh, be a quick win, if you like. And I think specifically to Professor Rajan, uh, ASEAN only progressed when India, the, uh, when Indonesia, the largest country, actually decided to take a leadership role and have an open policy. So uh, is India uh, in a position to do that? So we'll go around again. Uh, His Excellency Abdullah. Uh, these s s small steps uh, do matter. S sorry, we have uh, six <coughs> minutes left, so one and a half minutes each. Okay. And, uh, uh, this uh, regional, the local trade between India and Bangladesh recently. That's an example. It has made a lot of mm -hmm. differences. As far as, as in uh, Pakistan is concerned, this issue, uh, overcoming the issue of WAGA, mm -hmm. and also from Pakistan's pers perspective, their access to Central, Central Asia, to Tajikistan, trilateral agreement mm -hmm. is something that they are uh, seeking. Uh, these will be uh, these, these, these will have big impacts uh, on, our, on our situation. It's, uh, 
Uh, we have tried uh, in the past. We will continue to mm. do so. Uh, hopefully, uh, on the basis of common interest, uh, we will be uh, able to overcome uh, the challenge, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, everybody will benefit. Central Asia and South Asia, Afghanistan included. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, my, my short advice would be financial inclusion. Uh, a low uh, financial inclusion for the entire population. That's not going to be uh, happening with, ex uh, with um, existing banks. Uh, it will happen on digital uh, platforms. Uh, because that takes away inefficiency, it, it uh, increases productivity, and it also takes away the, the grey economy. The second one, it's increased transparency and fight corruption. Uh, I, and that we haven't discussed that. I think that's extremely important if we want both the national economies to grow, but also if we want to create that uh, this regional cooperation. Thank you. Excellency. As the chair country of uh, Southeast Asia, the United SARC, uh, we are trying our best to develop political understanding between the member countries, South, uh, South Asian countries. Uh, as well as we are trying our best to uh, develop connectivities, like uh, 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 teleconnectivity uh, or uh, connectivity in electricity or other electri uh, other uh, connectivities, and uh, we are discussing about uh, tariffs and non tariffs uh, uh, things, and we can uh, uh, bring them uh, in a favorable situation. I think, and uh, we have to uh, develop understanding and uh, remove misunderstanding and develop trust and remove untrust or mistrust among the member states and uh, the regional countries. And we have to develop our <coughs> regional trade as we talked about. And uh, for us, uh, like uh, Nepal, we cannot uh, wait for a long time. We, we have to develop very fastly. So everything in every aspect, every side, we are doing things very fast. With uh, China, with India, with Bangladesh, and with other neighboring countries as well, we are doing new agreements and implementing them. And internally, we are uh, making new policies to achieve our goal of uh, faster development and uh, to control corruption, as we mentioned. Control corruption and uh, provide service to the people. Uh, in this way, our efforts are, uh, as the uh, chairman of uh, SARC, to hold the SARC summit in the near future and develop the uh, all round ties and a relationship be between the countries in the region. Thank you, Prime Minister. Professor Rajan? Well, I just want to echo what you said, which is that uh, India is, is the largest country within the region, and to that extent, it could play uh, the role that you said Indonesia played, which is um, not so much lead the process as be willing to make a little more in terms of concessions mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. for people who fear that their opening up will lead to a swamping by Indian mm -hmm. industry. Can we make a little more in concession, but then see the promotion of, uh, of, of trade? Uh, there are many places where India has, has sort of uh, funded the process. Uh, I mean, just a very small example at the RBI, we hold the data mm -hmm. for the SARC region. And we manage that process. They feed the data to us. We host the database. But we pay for that. That's, that's an example of, uh, of the kinds of things that India does. But we can certainly do more. And we can certainly, on the trade side, uh, perhaps allow a process by which tariffs come down, but as countries get comfort mm -hmm. that they're not being swamped by Indian industry. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a very important for Indian industry yeah. also to take uh, steps to uh, push uh, government to start the process of region. And I think as the industrial countries look harder to do, with, do business with, uh, this regional focus will increase. Mm -hmm. And so I'm optimistic that we will have a more integrated region, maybe five divorces from now. <laughs> 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 
Thank you. And uh, I, that's a good optimistic note to end on. Uh, these things, I'll just, three concluding remarks. Uh, these things do take time. In the case of ASEAN, it took us 20, 30 years before we start with a trust dealing with the political issue before we went into the economic issue. Uh, but it did happen with leadership and uh, everybody committed. Uh, and uh, I think what I took away very well from uh, today's session is that while we are sorting out all the political difficulties and challenges, many steps can still be taken, small steps that can actually have big impact, whether it's cr cross-border infrastructure, uh, cooperation, uh, air uh, services liberalization, so sub-regional, sectoral uh, cooperation. Uh, and finally, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the role of business, financial inclusion. I think technology will uh, be also another big opportunity for this region, which will unite you in a way that you could never predict because the youth are going to be connected uh, if you are actually doing that. And they, they may be the one driving the process with the business. Yeah. And finally, uh, optimistic note from India. So uh, I think that's, that's a very good sign. So le let me uh, conclude this session. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Let's give them a, a round of applause. And thank you to the audience.